Hey guys, today we'll be taking a look at this 12.8 volt, 560 amp hour lithium iron phosphate battery from LitTime. You heard right, 560 amp hours. That's over 7.1 kilowatt hours of stored energy. These batteries just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. I remember several months ago back in January taking a look at a 460 amp hour for my first time and I called it massive and now we have 560 amp hours. I'm starting to run out of adjectives here. Anyway, so we'll go through the usual review process here today. Let's take a look at the specifications of this battery. We'll do some capacity testing and then we'll tear it down and see how it's built inside. This battery measures approximately 18 inches in width, 15 inches in depth, and 12 inches in height. And it weighs in at 133 pounds. This battery is built in a very nice heavy duty steel case. I just love seeing these steel cases. I know there are some applications where plastic is better, particularly in marine related environments, but uh, for my uses and my applications with solar, I love seeing steel cases. We do have two collapsible handles here on the top, uh, but given the weight of this battery at 133 pounds, I personally feel much more comfortable supporting it from the bottom. Uh, we have a few parameters printed on the top here, most we've already reviewed. This has a max continuous charge and discharge current of 250 amps or 3,200 watts. We've got some pretty nice terminals here with a lot of mass in contact area. These are M8 bolts. It's a standard bolt that we've seen on most of these batteries. And one thing I really like about these terminals are the covers it came with. So these covers actually latch into place and they don't fall back off. The cover has a number of knockouts here to accommodate different size wires, different size lugs. Taking a look at the manual, we have something that looks to be freshly written. It's not a copy and paste of other manuals like we've seen with some batteries. So we'll go straight to the specifications page here. It has a cycle life of 4,000 or more cycles. Of course, it does not define specifically what a cycle is. Recommended charge current of 112 amps. Max charge and discharge of 250. A surge rating of 1,000 amps for up to one second. It even has a recommended torque on the terminals. I don't know that I've seen many other batteries that give torque ratings for the terminals. This does feature low temperature charge protection, which of course we will test here. It should engage at zero degrees Celsius and then release at five degrees Celsius. You can connect up to four of them in series for a 48 volt system. And then we have a single page here on troubleshooting and that's pretty much all there is to see in the manual. All right, guys, we are charged up here. I charged this using my Ames uh, 12 volt. It's about a 70 amp charger. And the resting voltage here is a little low, though it did sit on this charger for approximately three days. Uh, so we'll see what our capacity is here. Maybe it's got some balancing to do. My test load will be a 48 volt charger. It's charging another battery bank. That way I'm not wasting the over 7,000 watt hours of power in this battery. So we'll just leave this run until hopefully the BMS in the battery shuts down the test. All right, so our test is running at 1.35 kilowatts here. That's 103 amps at the current voltage. And we're nearing the end of the test here, but we are still going strong at 110 amps. So far we've pulled 532 amp hours out of this battery. All right, we concluded at 563 amp hours. Unfortunately, the inverter did shut down before the battery once again. Uh, so I'll have to find a solution for that. But regardless, we did hit our rated capacity of 560. We actually exceeded it by approximately four amp hours. Ooh, battery. That is a very large BMS. Look how big it is. We've got four cells on each side here. So these are going to be 280 amp hour cells, which we probably could have guessed by the 560 amp hour rating. Uh, there is a QR code stamped on the cover of the cell. Uh, I wonder if that's going to match what's on the actual cell itself. We have three temperature sensors on this battery. One is going under the heat sink. It's going to be the sensor for the FET transistors. Uh, we have one coming out and it's going all the way to the right side of the case here. This is a temperature sensor. And then we have a third one here, which is going to the upper left and there's a separate temperature sensor there. Our positive conductor here is a pair of five gauge silicone insulated wires. It's a 200 degrees Celsius insulation rating. They are protected in this heat shrink, heat wrap, whatever you want to call it back to the main lug. There is a smaller cable also coming off that lug and feeding positive into the BMS. The negative cabling is comprised of four number eight gauge silicone insulated wires. So we have two coming off of this post going into the BMS and then we have two more coming off of this post and going into the BMS. 
And then we have the same on the output side of the BMS. We have four number eights going over to the main lug, the main terminal. This BMS does appear to be held down by two zip ties. There's a zip tie here. Let's see if there's anything else holding it down beside those. No, oh, it, is, it is glued down. It's glued down and I guess the zip ties are maybe there uh, for extra support or maybe to hold it down while the glue is drying. I do like how nicely routed these wires are though. They are zip tied into place at multiple points along the case here. Uh, and the balance leads are ring terminals. They appear to be crimped on heat shrink. They are secured at a different point on the bus bar from the main post. With the BMS out of the way, we can see how they bridge together the two groupings of cells here. They have two uh, large conductors running across from the two posts of the parallel cells. This is going to get my fingers pinched and it's going to hurt. Oh, I got it. Look at that. Talk about a reinforcing build. So they've got a steel plate on the end. In addition to the steel frame in the case, that's screwed down to this bottom tray thing uh, with the lip on that then sat down on this bottom space down here. And that is held in place by four screws, so you can remove that. There is material between the cells. There's foam padding between the cells and the steel plate. And it's actually loose in there a little bit. So we know these are hopefully uh, brand new cells that haven't expanded at all. Otherwise we'd feel some sort of tension in here, I would think. So now we can see our actual cells. And here's a quick look at the QR code. Uh, it does start with a 02K, which uh, I need to look that one up and see what brand that actually is here. So I couldn't really find much about these cells. I do believe the 02K is great power. So I believe these are great power brand cells, but I could not find any data sheets or specification sheets for them. Is that actually glued on there? Interesting, very interesting. We've got an insulator in here. This is an adhesive insulator. Uh, what appears to be some sort of hard material. I don't know if it's some kind of epoxy board or fibrous board. Uh, you can see the thickness of it there, but, but that's just a ring around the perimeter. So there is space in between the cells for them to expand and contract naturally. And this is something I've been doing in my own personal builds. There's space between the cells for them to expand and contract with this little gasket thing. So the whole battery pack lifts out of the assembly and you can see it is 100% pristine. There's not a thing wrong with it, not a mark, not a scratch, not a dent. There's a large piece of foam on the bottom here, which is gonna be pressing in the bottom of the actual case. And then we have the bracket here. I know it's hard to see on camera, but there is a plastic lining on both sides of this uh, where the cell is resting. It's not resting on the actual metal itself. These cells are spot welded in place. They're done very nicely from what I can tell. Very standard spot welding. Uh, we've got aluminum bus bars. They do have the expansion hump in the middle. Should the cells move at all, it helps reduce tension being put on the terminals. And there is quite a bit of thickness to them. Uh, one thing I've noticed on this battery is that none of these terminals are bent. And that sounds like a silly thing to say in a review, but I've seen so many batteries at this point where the manufacturer tightens down this screw, doesn't hold the terminal in place, and the whole terminal you know, the aluminum terminal twist because aluminum is a soft metal. All right, so I'm twisting this battery around here and getting ready to put it back in the case. And I just noticed something I don't really like. Uh, so on the cell that was facing away from the front of the battery, there's a decent size indent here at the top. Uh, there, I guess you can see it in this orientation. It's hard to make out, but there is a pretty large indent there. Now this was beat around in transport quite a bit. Also, these cells are actually resting on that thick piece of foam on the bottom. They're not even resting on this bracket. I can slide in and out this bracket like so. Uh, so I know you won't be able to see this very well, but that indent is lining up where exactly that red disc is pushing in on the cell. I don't know if that's because it got banged in shipping. That is very likely. But I do think as a future improvement on their part, um, simply having this insulator and maybe a piece of metal sticking up even a quarter inch above the cell uh, that way it's being supported by this top lip of the case here instead of pressing inward on the side of the cell. Uh, wouldn't be such a bad idea. Holy cow, guys. Look at these large globs of solder on the bottom of this BMS. Uh, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. They appear to be adhered well. They're adhered to the board well and they're adhered to the wire well, but I don't know that I've seen globs of solder that large before. So I did take the BMS apart here. There are a lot of thermal pads on pretty much all of the transistors. 
As I mentioned, this does have their own branding on here. It is model S12250 version 1.1, dated March 11th, 2024. Uh, these are going to be the balancing resistors and there's the transistors that control them. Uh, we do have some capped on tape here insulating the top of the circuit board just to protect it against the heat sink. Uh, these are the FET transistors, the charging and discharging. I'm not sure which ones are which. Uh, we have a series of resistors here, likely going to be shunting resistors. So this BMS knows the amount of current charging and discharging. You know, it is, it is conformally coded and I think they did a good job and I like to see a company engineering their own boards instead of simply slapping somebody else's in there. So now it's time for our low temperature charge protection test. You see the bench power supply here is charging at 4.18 amps. And I'm just gonna use this computer duster here on the temperature sensor. It should trip the charging protection. So let's go with the first one. Five seconds, it took five seconds for that to shut down. So we can go ahead and warm our sensor back up here. And in about three seconds, we began charging again. So let's try the other sensor. It's about five seconds, four and a half to five seconds there as well. And we are charging again. So the low temperature charge protection does work in this battery. All right, so this battery tested out perfectly. We Past the capacity test, the low temperature charge protection does indeed work. Uh, it's built pretty pretty well. We'll give it we'll give it an A minus maybe. Um, I do think they can do a little bit better in the cell caddies if you call them. Uh, simply making the support about a quarter of an inch higher so it covers the top of the cell. I do believe that dent was caused by shipping damage. This battery sells for $1,560. It does ship ground shipping, and my understanding is that batteries of this size should be getting shipped freight. At 133 pounds, the delivery guy had a hard time managing this battery and ended up doing a controlled drop off of the truck. And I think that's likely where this damage was sustained. If that wasn't the cause, I'm sure it suffered a few drops in transit simply because of its size and its weight. It really needs two people to lift. It took me two people to lift it up on this bench and the FedEx guy ended up just dragging it across the driveway. Shipping the battery freight on a small pallet would definitely increase the cost, but it would also ensure a more safe delivery. That's about all I have on this battery for the review. Uh, if you end up purchasing one or you have one or you know somebody who has one, I would love to know your experience. Please leave that down in the comment section. That feedback is valuable for me to know how the companies are doing in terms of customer service. And it's also valuable for anybody out there watching this video who may be interested in purchasing one. Otherwise, hit that like button before you go and thanks for watching.